seminar and happy new semester. Okay, it's not just a new year. Um, before we start, I would like to welcome our new faculty members. We have three of them here today. Uh, Jean Domek, Professor Jean Domek. And Professor Brad uh, Rosingham. <laughs> and Professor uh, Chris Buck, there. <laughs> Welcome. Okay. Um, my name is Chuan Min Hu. I lead the optical ocean lab in this college. And if you don't know the background of this seminar, I will put out a few words about it. Um, Starting from last spring, uh, every first Friday of the semester, uh, we have a faculty seminar. Okay. Uh, the purpose is to introduce the faculty, uh, particularly to the new students. I don't, I don't know how many students are here today, new students today. I know last fall we had 16 or 15 new students. I hope the majority of them are here. Um, I know you can get the information about the faculty, the professors from the web by reading their CV, but this is the time to meet them in person, okay, to talk to them. Uh, so that way uh, you can um, learn what they do okay, in person, uh, share their joy, and learn their success, <laughs> and sometimes frustration. Okay? <laughs> so that way when you design your projects or design your thesis topics, um, or when you have questions, you know whom to go to. Okay? We are all here. We are interdisciplinary college. Okay? So that's what we do here. Um, let's say this is the third in our uh, faculty seminar series. And we have uh, five speakers this morning. And show on the screen is the schedule. In the first session, we have three. And the second session, we have two. Uh, in between, we have a, a coffee break, thanks to Linda, and a beer break, thanks to our Dean Dixon. <laughs> okay, <laughs> she just bought a pack of beer. Okay. Um, at 4.30, we have our first TGIF, hosted by uh, our own MSEC. So please be there if you can. Uh, with that, I think we'll kick off the seminar with our Dr. John Paul, our distinguished university professor. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I'm going to wire me up here. You put it in your pocket. You have a place? Yeah. That should work. Okay, well, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm probably the person that's been here the longest in the audience, and I've and, uh, been here for 32 years. Uh, a very simple resume. I've had one job. Uh, but even though we, our seminars today are about diverse topics dealing with the ocean, I think a common thread we have is that we all love the ocean, everybody in this room. And in particular, I love field work and getting out on cruises, which I don't very often, but... In 2012, I had the fortune, the good fortune of being on the RV Atlantis, and here we are at sort of salinity zero, ground zero of the Amazon River entering the uh, South Atlantic Ocean. And uh, the mixing, it's such a dynamic area. You can see here the, the, uh, these sort of like uh, rivulets of... Uh, Amazon River water coming and mixing with the blue water of the uh, tropical South Atlantic. So it was very, uh, very dynamic. And this, this stretched for thousands of kilometers, this uh, mixing zone. So it's a very dynamic area with a lot of things going on. And we're looking at some very complex processes. And uh, if you don't understand anything that I'm talking about, the last three minutes I have a little video that was uh, developed on the project. Uh, that they say is at the level of eighth grade science, so I'll even understand it. So, <laughs> so why to go to Amazonas? Well, 
there was this NSF project called Anacondas, which is probably the worst use, uh, misuse of acronyms. Uh, they've got second and third uh, letters. And, but the main point uh, is that the, the important feature is, is this diatom symbiosis that I'm going to talk about uh, as sort of a driving force in this system. Uh, so this was an NSF multi-investigator study of the biogeochemical processes in the Amazon River plume and the impact on global change on these processes and these processes impact on global change themselves. Our project was called the River Ocean Continuum, Continuum of the Amazon, or ROCA, a little smaller acronym, but probably more forgettable. And uh, well, we're, this was funded by the Moore Foundation, the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation. And uh, this is to look at omics in the uh, Amazon River plume and four stations in the Amazon River. And by omics, uh, principally genomics and transcriptomics. So one of the big uh, issues here is these uh, diatom symbioses. So I'll jump right into the topic of, of DDAs. I don't know if anybody's heard of DDAs. But these are diatom diazotroph associations. That means a diatom... Uh, usually Hemialis or Rhizoselenia, and a nitrogen-fixing cyanobacteria, either pronounced as Richelia or Richelia intracellularis. And the cyanobacteria is a little nitrogen factory. It fixes nitrogen for the diatom inside the diatom cell. And uh, it has a, the uh, Richelia has an apical heterocyst which is where the nitrogen fixation occurs. And nitrogen fixation is converting atmospheric nitrogen into reduced nitrogen so that it can be used for plants and biosynthesis. Now these uh, DDAs, the two types, the um, rhizoselenia is a uh, chain-forming diatom, and this is in transmitted light, and then these two are epifluorescence lights, microscopy, and the red is the chlorophyll A, but the bright yellow thing is the, uh, the DDA, the Richelia, and that's because of its phycoerythrin emission. Uh, and you can see the heterocyst on the end. It looks like a double-headed microphone, perhaps. And then here in uh, Hemialis, you see these uh, DDAs are, again, fluorescing uh, orange or yellow when illuminated with blue uh, light. So they, uh, they have a critical role in the ecology of these diatoms, and as it turns out, in the driving of the uh, Amazon ri River uh, ecology, the plume ecology. Now, DDAs are an, an emergent player in a changing ocean. They're abundant in mature river plumes, uh, and these are all f uh, forms of nitrogen have been stripped out by what I call the nitrogen hogs. The nitrogen hogs are centric diatoms, uh, which uh, are right at the mouth of river plumes as the rivers go into the ocean. And there's a tremendous amount of uh, primary production going on there. Uh, once that's been depleted, the nitrogen's been depleted, but there's still silica and phosphorus present, uh, the D DDAs uh, start taking over. And we find that the DDAs are in the Amazon, the Mekong, the Mississippi, the Congo, and Orinoco rivers. And we also know that elevated DDAs have been found in the tropical North Pacific and Eastern Mediterranean oceans. And uh, although I'm not a paleoceanographer, there, there have been high CO2 events in the past. And these CO2 events in the past have left a, uh, a marking in the sediment. Uh, this is uh, from the Mediterranean Late Quaternary Core, uh, ODP 160, and this is the Oops. This is the core, and then in here are something called sapropels. Do we have a geologist that can help quickly? Sapropel. Organic rich uh, sediments. Uh, uh, okay, well, and, and, and then if you look at this with the electron microscope, you see massive uh, piles of uh, hemialis or Richelia. So these organisms have been very dominant in past uh, very uh, high CO2 environments on the planet. Okay. 
So the stations, the crews that I'm going to talk about uh, occurred in uh, 2010, and Brian Zielinski was aboard that cruise on the, the Noor. And there are a bunch, the cruise track looks like it's kind of going every which way, but uh, the uh, Amazon River mouth is down here, and the plume, as you can see by satellite, is the green stuff in the back. And uh, these are stations that we didn't sample, but the uh, for our omics studies, but the stations here, 25, 23, 27, 2, 3, and 10. And if we start with 10, which is the lowest salinity that we got to, uh, because we couldn't get into Brazilian waters, we didn't have clearance, uh, is characterized by a tremendous uh, diatom bloom, and it's our lowest salinity. We have something that's sort of uh, higher salinity at station 3, Station 2 and 25 are very interesting because this is where we found a tremendous signature of the uh, DDAs. And then uh, 27 is an oligotrophic ocean station. So these are sort of the major characteristics and the station out here outside the plume is salinity 35.3. So today I'm going to be talking about transcription and this ought to make everybody's eyes glaze over. But uh, if we look at uh, biology, the genetic information in us organisms uh, is in the DNA, and it's just a storage, a repository. Uh, it, they're the genes that define who we are and what we are. But unless they're expressed, and that is turned in the process of messenger RNA, in the process of transcription, uh, they're really not doing very much. Uh, when genes are turned on and activated and, and are going to perform a function in the environment, the first step is transcription into messenger RNA, which in my rendition here is blue. And then the translation process into protein involving ribosomes uh, produces the polypeptide chain. And that process is called uh, proteomics, if you study protein. What we're studying is the activation of genes in transcriptomics. <coughs> and what we did is our uh, angle of the story was to look at the eukaryotes, uh, principally the phytoplankton, and we had a technique. We used a two micron filter to collect these guys, and so most of the bacteria are going to pass through. And then uh, uh, this was filtered, samples were filtered in less than 30 minutes. And in some instances, well, in all instances, we added an internal control RNA. We're going to talk about that in a little bit. Uh, but we, uh, the molecular uh, methods include uh, trapping the poly-DA transcripts, which are principally the eukaryotic ones, and then Illumina sequencing to produce about 20 million uh, paired end reads. That means uh, sequences. And then the bioinformatics, and this is, you know, starving for knowledge. What does it all mean? Uh, it's just, uh, here are the stations, and uh, station, when we did each one in duplicate. We had duplicate transcriptomes, and uh, there's the unpaired reads, and... Uh, uh, we, when we added our internal standard, this is the recovery of the internal standard, uh, which sometimes was variable, and, and uh, I'm going to talk about that in a little bit. But uh, 89 million uh, reads passed quality control, so uh, there's quite a bit of information there. Uh, now, we decided because of computational limits, we weren't going to analyze every sequence by comparing it against all the known sequences in GenBank or some other database, what we said is let's take 31 genes that we think are going to be important out there and see how they're expressed at the various environments. And each gene we picked uh, was represented by 20, 10 to 20 different uh, protein sequences or different flavors of that particular gene. Uh, we included the paralogs, and the, that's, uh, those are genes which are have either evolved the way in function uh, that we would subtract out. Uh, our gene hits uh, to our database were submitted to CAMERA, which is a, a uh, genomics website, 
and we blasted them against RefSeq, which is a, a database, a fairly a better curated database for phylogenetic information. And the advantage is that we have a much higher confidence in our gene annotations. We have a much higher confidence in identifying the genes that were out there at the various stations. So the biogeochemical categories that we were looking at we were interested in carbon autotrophy, carbon heterotrophy, nitrogen, phosphorus acquisition, sulfur, uh, silicon, and, and vitamins. Now, how do we make this uh, quantitative? And this is a point of uh, contention between uh, our lab and, and our collaborators. Uh, the first method is to add an internal control messenger RNA at the time of extraction. That is, you add a purified amount, so many copies of, a, of one particular gene as an internal control, and the recovery gives you the depth of sequencing or how far into the community you've sequenced. The reports are in transcripts per liter, which is uh, good because you can compare it to biogeochemical uh, data, but the problem is the reproducibility of the recovery of the standard and then you get this inshore to offshore autocorrelation. In other words, if there's a lot of uh, gene expression at a particular station, is that because there's lots of genes there uh, doing it, lots of cells doing it, or just a, f a few cells with a very high level of expression? So what we have did is we looked at, uh, we normalized to library size. That means we report the number of transcripts we find of a particular gene per 10 million of total transcripts that we recover. And that's a way of normalizing a very, very uh, biologically active uh, station with a very uh, low activity or offshore oligotrophic station. And it lets you know which environments have the active versus the lazy cells, which cells are pulling their weight. Now, we talked about DDAs. Here's the, uh, this is a satellite chlorophyll image. And there's our station 10. Uh, which was the nitrate hogs, and then station 2 and 25 are our DDA containing. And we look at the, the diatoms here in the blue uh, columns, and we see station 2 and station 10 and station 25 and station 27. Station 27 has uh, an order of magnitude or, to or so less diatoms. But we find that in station 10, we, our DDAs are virtually uh, absent. Uh, and this is based on microscopic counts. So we f find these guys that are symbionts are in these two stations. And it's interesting that the station two was sampled coming in, and then all these stations were sampled around here, and the station 25 was uh, sampled coming out. And there seems to be some consistency in the signal of what we find in those stations. Uh, and station 2 and station 25, this uh, blue box at the top is the signal of the uh, 16S ribosomal RNA. That's a way of quantifying uh, how many of the uh, cyanobacterial symbionts were present. So this is a, a uh, busy figure, as most of them will be. Uh, but this shows our 31 genes of interest across here. And then we start with station 27 in the front, uh, and that was the offshore oligotrophic. And we end with station 10 in the back, which is the hypertrophic uh, diatom bloom containing station. And, we, and the, the gene count, as you can see, varies tremendously. It's orders of magnitude different. Uh, some important points here is carbonic anhydrase. This is uh, one of the uh, key enzymes which is involved in carbon sequestration or, or removal of CO2 uh, from the water and making it available for carbon fixation. We find that the highest level of the uh, delta carbonic anhydrase was in our station 10, our diatom enriched station. And we also find here, if we look over here at the eukaryotic nitrate transporter gene, the gene that transports nitrate uh, is also extremely high at that station. Uh, and we also see here the urea transporter. So uh, that's uh, consistent with the biogeochemical uh, data. We're seeing the expression of genes that we might expect to be in those different environments and at those different levels. And then we observe some other interesting relationships. Here's the dissolved inorganic carbon concentration on this axis, and this is the uh, messenger RNA 
of the uh, carbonic anhydrase, which uh, is part of the carbon concentrating mechanism. And we see that as, the, um, as we deplete the DS DIC, the amount of gene expression is increased. Uh, and these uh, are diatoms that can pull down and draw down CO2 uh, even though the levels are relatively low, that they, they're little CO2 incorporating factories. Uh, we see a relationship between urea concentration and salinity, and here we see a salinity of the track. We can see the, the plume in the center. Uh, nitrate was not a big player in the system. It was only found at station uh, 10, where the big diatom bloom was. And here we see uh, phosphate concentration uh, in relationship with polyphosphate kinase. Polyphosphate kinase is an enzyme which uh, uh, adds uh, phosphorus to polyphosphate. It's a phosphorus acquisition type of system. So we can see biogeochemical activities and relate them to the, uh, the gene expression patterns. Now, how do you visualize uh, data like this? The bar graph was uh, unappealing because it blocked uh, a lot of the, uh, the data because of the three-dimensional bar graph. So here's what we call our dot blot. And uh, here, are, again, are 31 genes of interest. And we see that station 10 uh, right here, which is the blue X, is pretty much the winner at most of these, uh, for most of these genes. Uh, it seems to be, a, this is the uh, diatom bloom. We expect a lot of activity going on. But this is expressed in the amount of transcripts per liter. If we normalize it by, let's say, chlorophyll or fluorescence, uh, we find that now that our, our blue axis are the losers. Uh, and what that simply means is that uh, we normalized our, to a proxy for phytoplankton biomass. And now station 10, even though it has a lot of biomass, the level of gene expression is relatively low per unit gene expression. So they're actually just hanging out, uh, not doing as much as they possibly could be doing. And then we asked ourselves, what if we looked at the relative expression of genes from, let's say, station 25, which is our DDA station, here, and what if we looked at the relative expression of station 20? Uh, station, or excuse me, station two, which is our DDA bloom, uh, and then our, our second DDA bloom, which it turns out looks like it was a bloom on the way out because of the differences in level of gene expression, but you can see the pattern, what we call the pattern of gene expression is very similar. Now, there's no logical reason to connect the dots with a line because they, these are uh, independent uh, data which aren't related to each other, but if you uh, perhaps what we're saying here is that stations with similar patterns of expression perhaps have equal or similar biogeochemical function. And station two, as I said, we view as the active diatom diazotroph station, and station 25 is the declining station. So we can look at these patterns different ways. We can plot this data uh, numerous uh, different ways, and this is what we're going to submit, hopefully this week or next week, uh, a sort of a polar plot uh, where the, um, it's just, uh, you can visualize uh, better what stations are doing what. And here we're looking at three of the stations, station 10, which again is our, our massive diatom bloom, and station 25 and station 2, which are the two DDA stations. And they're green and black, and most of the greens and blacks are just right on top of each other showing that they're they have very similar patterns of expression, whereas the blues are at a higher level of expression, carbonic anhydrase pulling down the CO2, or eukaryotic nitrate transporter. Now, so how do you compare these stations? What can you do? Well, we did a principal component analysis of our 31 genes over here. And what we find is that the oligotrophic station 27 is furthest away from the eutrophic station 10. We expect the processes to be different, the biomass, the gene expression. Uh, our DDA stations, 2 and 25, are grouped very close to each other. And our 3 and 23 just are sort of floating somewhere in between. 
Now, we had the, the great fortune of having a uh, former scientific grand student of mine uh, who's at the uh, J.C. Venter Institute actually go through the process of sequencing all the, uh, or interpreting all the sequences of all the libraries by something called PFAM analysis, which looks at protein families. And uh, we developed a similar plot to this. And uh, you can see things like the, uh, oh, where is it? Carbonic anhydrase of, uh, where is it here? No, that's not, there's another carbonic anhydrase over here somewhere, bicarbonate transporter family. Oh, here it is, the eukaryotic type uh, carbonic anhydrase, again, is very high in station 10 compared to 25 <coughs> and 2, and that's the, the uh, depleted uh, station. Uh, and uh, the silicon transporter is actually very high at the DDA stations compared to the uh, uh, station 10. So if we look at the PFAM uh, analysis and we look at the uh, principal component analysis, we see the same thing. We see uh, station 10 and station 27 being very different and station 2 and 25 being very similar. Well, then we said, okay, so that's looking at the, gene, the patterns of gene expression. What happens if we look at the actual biogeochemical data and what we call our meta metadata analysis? Uh, that is uh, uh, chlorophyll, temperature, salinity. Uh, I believe there's diatom counts in there. It's a hodgepodge of, of biogeochemical measurements. And interestingly enough, we find that 25 and 2 are so similar, they're actually right on top of each other. You can't see the two there. And then the same observation that 10 and 27 were very, very different. So we can answer some overall uh, questions about the similarity and differences in environments. And we can look at the function of the genes. And we can look at the actual activities uh, that these genes uh, encode. Now, so what we, up to this point, we've said these are the 31 genes we want to know about in the environment. What if we ask the other question, what are the most abundant genes out there in terms of, of transcripts? And I call this as JP's hit parade, greater than 10,000 copies. In other words, to be on this, in this club, you have to have at least 10,000 copies of the transcript present, which means you're a very highly expressed gene. And this is, uh, again, our collaborators at... Uh, JCVI, Andy Allen did this. And of course, the very first gene is elongation factor 2. Now, probably, if you're not a biologist, you've probably never heard of this, but that's something that's in the ribosome that assure, ensures that protein synthesis occurs. Uh, we have uh, heat shock protein 20, uh, the second uh, greatest hit, and that's just a molecular chaperone that assures that proteins are assembled correctly. Uh, we, our third hit, there's nothing known. There's no PFAM that hits it. It's clearly unknown. And the organism that it's, that it's most closely related to is in rice. So clearly, this part of the database uh, is lacking. This is a totally unknown. Uh, photosynthetic reaction center protein is the fourth greatest hit. And the organism is, that uh, is pseudonychia multiseries. And so we go on here. Uh, glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate dehydrogenase, what we would call housekeeping genes. Um, a couple other unknowns, a heat shock protein. Here's a potato inhibitor family, uh, similar to a, a gene in the Meliani Huxleyi, but uh, we have no idea what that's doing. Uh, and then there's cytochrome C oxidase. And what we would call housekeeping, housekeeping genes, or what I call uh, metabolic boredom, uh, the, the uh, bio geochemical genes are expressed at a much lower copy number. And if you think about it, the genes that keep you alive occupy most of your metabolism. But from a, whether you're looking at carbon fixation, nitrogen flux, uh, they're uh, expressed at a lot higher uh, level than what I would call the more interesting genes. So then we look at uh, the, the modern genomic kind of uh, visualization 
uh, process. And uh, this looks to me like, if you've ever been in Pennsylvania Dutch country, it looks like a hex sign or something. But what it is, uh, uh, our colleagues at JCVI uh, shared this with us. It's a plot of the different organisms uh, and the, the species of diatoms. And we have chrysophytes, cryptomonads, rhodophytes, dinoflagellates. We have some fungi. And these are all sequences for one gene, the nitrate transporter gene. So we're looking at one process, the uptake of nitrate. And what we uh, see are these are or all organisms taken out of the database. And then what we have here, we have uh, colored wheels, which represent the stations. Again, station 10. And we can see station 10. And this, the size of the wheel is proportional to the amount of genes uh, copies. In other words, the, the strength of expression of that gene in that environment. So, uh, and then we can see uh, station 23 is here as, as another circle. And station 3, we have this organism here. So, uh, at this distance, uh, you see a sort of, uh, you can say, well, OK, station 10 is producing most of the transcripts. But what exactly is the organism that's doing that? So let's zoom in right in here and look at these two wheels. And here you can see the, this is the diatom family. Over here, this is the uh, green uh, chlorophytes. And uh, if you follow this line in, it comes out to uh, indicate uh, Ceteroceros mulleri uh, at the highest concentration. Uh, so it gives us an indication of the concentration of gene expression, the um, environment from which this was, because it's a green circle at station 10, and then the exact taxa, the exact uh, organism that's performing this function is shown uh, by the line which connects with the, the, the center of the circle. Now, another interesting feature is that the, uh, the second largest group of <coughs> nitrate transporters, if we follow the line out, goes to Micromonas, uh, uh, Micromonas species. And Micromonas is what we would call an LRGT, a little round green thing. Uh, if, if you... If you go to uh, uh, if you go into any river, the phytoplankton is dominated. If you go to Mississippi, the Orinoco, if you're actually in the river, the phytoplankton is dominated by these LRGTs, little round green things. And then once the the mud uh, drops out and the uh, in the ocean, and you you, uh, you get away from light limitation, um, then the diatoms take over. Uh, okay, so analysis of gene expression is a powerful tool to interrogate ecosystem function and responses to perturbation. Uh, and uh, we talked about delta carbonic anhydrase, a key component of diatom carbon concentrating mechanisms uh, that enables the centric diatoms to continue CO2 fixation at low PCO2s and deplete nitrate in low salinity high plume waters. Areas depleted of nitrogen, but with silica and phosphorus, gave rise to DDA blooms. Patterns of gene expression in ocean phytoplankton communities show some degree of stability over time, that we can see the same patterns in uh, nearby stations. And modern bioinformatic tools can yield measurements of expression of biogeochemically important genes at the resolution of individual taxa, depending upon the quality of the database. Now, can I have th just three minutes? <coughs> Oops. Uh, okay, so how did we get this going the last time? Oh, there. Well, you can't try to click on this. Okay, now. Pull up this screen down here in the corner. Okay, click on the, click on, 
click on this to be a full screen. This one? Yeah, and then click on start. There you go. So this was made by uh, our collaborators at the University of Southern California. It sounds like Ricardo Maltobaum. It's the story of two microscopic creatures caught between life and death, whom together bring life to an entire ocean. We begin in the Amazon rainforest. At 2.1 million square miles, it is the single largest forest in the world, larger than the jungles of Africa, Asia, and Australia combined. At its heart, there is a river. Rich there is a river. And to end, this artery stretches 4,345 miles from the mountains of the Andes all the way across South America to the Atlantic Ocean. Enough fresh water spills forth from its mouth every year to fill Mount Everest three times. Now, how do you fill Mount Everest once? <laughs> nutrients, nitrogen, phosphorus, and silica leach from the land, the mountains, and the trees. It causes a feeding frenzy when the river finally meets the sea. Microscopic plants called phytoplankton use the natural fertilizer to bloom and grow in such massive numbers that you can see them from space. But before long, though, the nitrogen is gone, and with it, much of the, the life. Party's is over. <laughs> Without nitrogen, nothing grows. In a barren, stark ocean like the tropical Atlantic, carbon dioxide leaks out into the atmosphere with no plant life around to take it in. And so, the leftovers from the coastal feast float outward into the lonely sea. This is where teamwork and a bit of luck pays off. A tiny plant called a diatom gets together with a primitive microbe called a cyanobacterium. The diatom can use the river's leftover nutrients to make food if it can only get some nitrogen. Fortunately, its partner can extract nitrogen from the air. And so they share the spores. They grow and bloom together. They multiply in such numbers that they reverse the flow of carbon from the atmosphere back into the ocean. On board the Nord, a 279-foot-long lab on a ship, we measure how this carbon is pulled back into the ocean. By analyzing the contents of the water in several places in the bloom, we discover something surprising. This tiny team makes food two to three times more efficiently than everything else. In doing what so, is everything else? They so? provide about half the food in this region. A microscopic partnership less than one one thousand of an inch in size feeds a region that in the summertime is nearly three times the size of California. And they're not alone. You may even find them around the river near you. <laughs> Thank you, John. It's wonderful. <laughs> uh, we have time for one short question only. All right, Maya. So you have this, two, and you're connected up. Uh, yeah. Uh, you have these two stations that like, really kind of follow the same functional patterns. Right. Were they similar phylogenetically as well? Or, right, because people always argue, it doesn't matter who's there, or does it doesn't matter what they're doing. Uh, <laughs> I believe so. I, I'm trying to think of how we would show that. Would that... Uh, Brian, was that with the uh, Andy's data? Yeah, we don't have that yet. So, okay. Yeah. Or the camera, the Repsi kits from the functional genes. Yeah, uh, those were, we, we blasted those against the, uh, the 31 genes uh, against the uh, RefSeq, and uh, they fell in the same category, but I don't know if we, I don't know what genetic resolution we had at that point. I don't know. Okay, I'm done. <laughs> Next. JP. Ah. Okay. Okay. 
it doesn't actually make the audience hear better or hear you, but it makes the camera hear you. Okay. We have a total of 30 minutes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we'll see. Um, and a laser pointer? Um, Did John steal that too? Oh, here it is. But you have to plug in the, uh, the chip. <laughs> 